Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's underground session. For those of you that don't know what a peer here is, we are basically Airbnb for retail. As my sort of version of a cheap night ad explains, anyone with an idea from a small entrepreneur to a big global brand can find space on a peer here to make it happen. And we've got offices in London, Paris, New York and help some of the coolest brands in the world bring their ideas to life. So today is all about menswear and our panel of designers, editors, and influencers will be exploring the rise of the industry, how retailers are adapting, and the new definitions of masculinity. So if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to tweet in. It's hashtag underground sessions. And at the end, I'll be brought the questions. We'll make sure we ask them. At the same time, towards the end, stick up your hands. You can interrupt, and um, as long as it's interesting. So, first of all, we've got Matt over here. So, Matt is the founder of Trunk. I don't know if any of you have been to Marlebone and seen the beautiful Trunk shop and its sister shop, a couple of doors down, that does accessories on Chilton Street. And Trunk has everything from emerging and established brands from around the world, but it also has its own label. Matt will tell us a little bit more about that. Next to me, I've got Atip, who's the fashion director of High Snobiety. It's making me feel incredibly uncool, but I'm happy that my shoes and your jacket are coordinating. Um, he spent the majority of the last 20 years plus developing his career in avant-garde fashion and arts, from walking the catwalks of London and Paris to honing his own skills behind the camera. Today, he's the fashion director of what many would see the street-style Bible, High Snobiety. And then, I'm just getting my cards a bit muddled up, so just bear with me. We've got, you, you're definitely not um, Nick. So Lou, who is next to me, is the uh, founder of Lou Dalton and one of the few, fa the few female designers on the British menswear scene. Lou has fast become a figurehead for homegrown talent here at London Collections Men's. She's produced capsule collections for everyone from Dover Street Market to Grenson to Liberty and Opening Ceremony. And her designs are stocked across the UK, Europe and Japan, the sort of heart of menswear. Um, then we've got Nick over here, who's the contributing fashion editor of GQ. And Nick started out running social media for Mr. Porter before leaving to work on the fashion team at GQ and has worked previously also for brands like Joe Malone, Burberry, Hackett, and Dolce and & Gabbana. And finally, we have Mr. Phil Green, um, the slightly younger version than the uh, other man in retail. <laughs> and... Um, so he's at Farfetch, he looks after their global private client team and is responsible for providing Farfetch's top spending customers. So basically, the men around the world that have the ability to spend a huge amount on men's fashion come to this guy. And Farfetch is the leading site globally which connects all of the coolest fashion boutiques in the world. So I think it's got an we'll have an interesting view on what's going on around the globe in men's fashion wear. So we're gonna kick off straight away. First question is the rise of menswear. So new reports have revealed that the growth of the global menswear market will outperform womenswear by 2020. I guess, why do we think that menswear at this moment in time is growing so fast? And let's start off with Nick. What changes have you seen? Oh, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I, what, do you know anything more about those figures at all and what that sort of includes when it comes to menswear and women's wear. Nick, nice one, Nick. Because Nick, okay. Nick, Nick. <laughs> Let's throw it back on. Nick, Mara. we've only My just met. It's your first question. Don't, don't upset me in your first answer. Um, my, uh, my hunch would be that um, that figure probably includes um, things like sportswear under the menswear umbrella. Um, and I think that whilst there are a lot of, I, I mean, I would say that, yes, men are buying more than they previously used to do, but I imagine there, there has been this huge boom in sportswear and what is sort of effectively gender neutral clothing, um, but still kind of falls under the menswear moniker of most traditional places that are compiling um, uh, studies like that, I, I would just think. Um, partially. So I think that one of the reasons that menswear is traditional sort of menswear is probably growing is because sportswear is such a huge category at the moment for both men and women. Um, but also, you know, I think there are lots of things that can be said about how menswear has grown so quickly um, in such a relatively short period of time. Almost, you know, the, the time that I've been kind of in the industry, which is, 
you know, about around 10 years. Um, and that can be down to a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons that I think is um, particularly uh, important is that simply um, it's a subject that more men um, talk about and feel more comfortable um, spending time on and talking about with their friends and exploring in shops that they probably traditionally, like the generation above us, probably wouldn't have done. Um, it's now an activity that is a, as a communal activity and a, and a glamorous activity, effectively. Thank you, Nick. And um, even though I feel like I've been fact-checked more than Donald Trump, um, <laughs> going, going to you, Phil, um, look, Jap places like Japan, menswear outperforms women's wear. We're then seeing people like Nordstrom in the US launching a menswear shop as their first store in, in, in New York City. So, you know, menswear is definitely on the increase. I guess the question for, for you is, with what you're seeing globally, are you seeing that reflected in Farfetch's numbers, but also as a private client side, what's the most interesting stuff you've seen with menswear in the last few years that supports that belief? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with Nick. I think that what's really kind of fueling it is the, is the online market. I think that's from when I, when I heard that stat, you know, that's what first came to my mind that in by that year, that you know, men are essentially kind of a creature of habit. You know, we don't really go outside the lines. We like to kind of keep to what we actually know. Um, so having something like that kind of start really says to me, especially on a global scale, that men like to keep to what they know and then also can actually re return back to as well. So the, the online customer, I think it's going to be really feeling that kind of growth. And Matt, what have you seen in this upturn? In what, sir? <laughs> so sort of with what's going on right now, you've been in menswear yeah. for a long time. What are you seeing? Do you agree with that fact? Yeah, yeah, I mean, totally. I, I, I think it's primarily three different uh, parts. I mean, I mean, people like, or I mean, sites like High Sombiety and uh, other social media or blogs and media in general, there's so much more information out there that is targeting a lot of different interests and niches which weren't just available anymore. So I think this is something that, there's just so much more information out there that is, uh, relevant for lots of different people. And I think also, thanks to sites like uh, Farfetch or Mr. Porter, and lots of these items are accessible, which they weren't in the past in the same way. And I think also to what Nick was saying, I, mean, it's, it's, I think it's become more accepted uh, to be, I mean, to, as a man, to care about what you're wearing. It's sort of maybe 20 years ago wasn't accepted to sort of uh, care too much about it, but now that's changed completely, I think. And you, you sort of just touched upon the stuff with high sobriety and you know, streetwear is a great example. We're speaking about sportswear, but I guess streetwear is one of those things that is taking over in a big way. But at the moment, it's very focused on menswear, even though it's probably a unisex audience buying from those brands. What are you seeing going on in the market? I mean, I, what I've been saying to my friends and colleagues in the industry right now is that streetwear is the new luxury, which therefore in turn makes the accessibility to for customers or people in general to kind of be part of a tribe or be part of something that they couldn't necessarily be part of before, way more accessible. And I do think also, going back to your point, Matt, is that men actually do care about what we look like. It's not just about our wives and girlfriends, it's about us, our friends, what we're gonna talk about, you know, what's the next sneaker we're gonna buy, what's the next shoe we're gonna buy, what's the next coat we're going to buy, is it going to be Stone Island, is it going to be Supreme, is it going to be North Face, is it going to be Valentino? Um, so yeah, I think also with titles and publications like High Sobiety, it gives this next generation an opportunity to discover products far more easier mm. than when I was shopping and growing up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had to ask my friends in retail, like, where did you get that? Who, who could I talk to to get this? Or, you know, that's... The information is out there, the product is way more accessible, which, you know, means it's a bit more inclusive. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is even if you look at, like, Vuitton right now, who's just put Virgil in as head of menswear, a few years ago, no one would have even known who the head of menswear outside of fashion was for no. someone like Louis Vuitton. No. Yet now we're as excited as who's heading up menswear as who's heading up womenswear. Yeah. Surely that's a massive shift that supports that belief. I mean, that's a smart move by Bernard Arnault to get, you know, Virgil in there because I think the House of Vuitton, it's a very old house and with Virgil's prowess at making a logo work, he's reinvigorated, reinvigorated that LV logo and is also making the brand 
way more appealing to a generation that may not have been gone into any. And just to stay on this for a moment, so streetwear's exploded. We're now saying that it's, it's moving on to other industries like luxury, and like luxury's always been about scarcity, right? This is a new way yeah. of looking at that. But is it at risk of becoming a victim of its own success? And, and how can it stay authentic when you're seeing different people and major brands appropriating what they're doing? Um, if you look at Supreme, we thought that bubble would burst. It's not going to. Simple. And why do you believe it's not going to? Um, I thought it would, to be honest with you. <laughs> but um, there's just a hunger for it. And the way that that business is being driven with the nous that he has over the years and now with the investment, it's, it's going to be around forever. It's too iconic to die. But you're not seeing its excitement disappear in, what, no. in the stuff you're doing. No. And Phil, you, you're, you're the guy that if the top people around the world with money you spend on menswear, if they can't get hold of something, they're going to call this Phil Green, not the other one. And when they do that, Fingers they crossed. make the phone call. Um, <coughs> what are they saying? What are they looking for? And talking about, and I'm, I'm thinking more of the streetwear thing here. Yeah. Following on from what um, Atip just said, do you believe that Supreme and businesses like this are only going to continue to thrive, or do you think this is a, we're in a moment? No, I do think that they are still going to continue to be as strong as they kind of were. I think, like we said, that none of us thought that they would actually kind of keep gathering the pace that they have done. But to to your point about you know Virgil coming into Vuitton about being I think it's been a really sort of strategic move by the brand where they've kind of really capitalised on that kind of logo and they've got somebody who's like really current and actually seen as kind of cool within industry that's actually going to carry it forward so I think in the same way that a lot of creative directors for a lot of these brands are moving on I think that's going to be something that's going to be quite current and it's going to be seen a lot more of in years to come and in terms of what you're being asked for in your job, what are you being asked for the most in, in the world of menswear? It's, it's, it's literally that. So having sort of the global role that I have, it gives you that really amazing sort of insight into what's actually been asked. And it is all about what people see sort of through social media, through blogs, anything like that. So it's the Yeezy, it's Supreme, it's, you know, Vuitton. It's all those sort of key sort of brands which are for the moment. But people are actually... Interesting that you just mentioned brands that fit to what we're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. So I'm going to pause here for a moment. And what I want to do is understand a little bit more about you guys. So we're now all saying menswear's taking off. It's, we're in this moment. It's exciting. It's growing. You guys have been in menswear for a while. Why did you get into it? Where did it start from? Lou, you're a woman in menswear. Tell us about that story and why you started the brand that you started. Um, <coughs> excuse the mic, don't I? Um, I, mean, I, I left school at 16. Um, and so uh, there used to be um, an incentive by the Conservative Party called the Youth Training Scheme. And I was one of those recipients on the Youth Training Scheme and left <laughs> school at 16 and worked for um, a tailor back in my hometown of Shropshire. Um, <clears throat> Arthur Pardington, Pardy Clothing, used to make shooting breeches um, for the likes of Purdy and Son in London and the local farmer in, in and around Shropshire. Um, so basically, all I knew was menswear, you know, I started this apprenticeship straight out of school and all I was embraced with was, I used to call it, you know, cloth of the land, which was, you know, um, cord, heavy thick cord, heavy boiled walls, you know, whatever you wanted to, <laughs> to get your hands on to make a really hard wearing shooting breech. So it was inevitable that I suppose when you're, when you're that age, you're, you're like a sponge. So all I kind of knew was menswear um, equally, my own aesthetic when I was growing up was always a bit tomboy-like, and I was never really a girl-girl, you know. I mean, I love a lip and I love an earring now, but I was always very much um, driven by menswear, more so because of the attention to detail um, and sort of the regimented approach that most of the men in my life tend to take when they're selecting their wardrobe. Um, so... Whilst I was studying well, on this apprenticeship, I chose to go back into education um, and eventually ended up at the Royal College of Art. There was a, a long, <laughs> a few years more of, you know, um, education before I ended up there. But um, it wasn't, when I graduated from the Royal College of Art in menswear, I went straight out to Italy to work. Um, and 
it was never my intention to have my own label. My intention was to just gain as much experience as possible in this industry. And my advice to anyone who wants to do that is gain as much experience as you possibly can, whether it be an internship, whether it be working full time, because that's your portfolio of contacts that allows you to go it alone. Um, so I worked for 10 years. Um, once I went back into education, graduated in 98, worked for 10 years, started 2008. And, and that, what I'm really interested in is, you know, at Appear here, we always talk about ideas, where they come from, mm -hmm. and often that transition from a thought to an idea. What was that moment where you had that spark and you went, do you know what, I'm going to do my own label? And where did that come from? Why did you do it? Yeah, it's weird, actually. I, I, I always sort of... I was working for a Japanese company that had a design studio based in London, and I'd actually interned with them whilst I was at the Royal College of Art. I then went out to Italy and worked in Bologna for a while and kept in contact with this company, and they offered me this job. They were, we were making and designing for United Arrows, Beams, and Ships, and part of my <coughs> job, as well as designing this collection, was to get it made. Yeah. And part of, we're talking, what, nine, well, 2000, yeah, 2000, or something like that, where Made in the UK was still very much a big thing in Japan, and still is. And part of the process was to go around the, the British Isles and work with these manufacturers. So one of those places was Shetland, um, and I was working with Jameson's Knitwear, and we were producing some amazing fair isles, and I just came up with this, I found this old fair isle in, in Shetland in this charity shop, and it was a little kid's sweater. And I thought, oh, that'd be amazing if you put a bit of fluoro through it and whatnot. And, and it was just that moment. I thought, oh. So the spark oh, was looking at a know, sweater. You know, United Iris didn't want it. I'll have it then. So it was that kind of moment. Um, and then a good friend of mine who was the buyer at the time for Com Shirt, um, or sales agent for Com Shirt, said, oh, Lou, you should do your own thing. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. But, you know. Um, and again, it was, it, it just, yeah, it, it, I had the moment, I had the idea, but again, it was about gaining as much information and having as many facts of know-how and how to do it as possible before going into that. What I love there is when you hear, when we speak, see, speak to a lot of people that have created their own brands, is you realize serendipity and you realize that, you know, someone's maybe going down a bit of a different path. They didn't set out for that, but mm. somehow something happens, and often somebody tells them they should go for it that allows them to, to do that. It's a really inspiring story. And Matt, when you think about what you're doing with Trunk, yep. you know, I've loved you guys for a long time, but what made you create your own little menswear store, now big menswear store online, but that little tiny boutique, and find the world's best brands to put that together there? No, it's, it's a good question, and also like you, I mean, I didn't set out to do this at all. I mean, had you asked me 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago, it was not really on my radar at all. I mean, I think it's all the different things I've done up until then, it sort of all came together, and it felt like the right thing to do. Dots connect. Uh, so, I mean, I've had quite a different background. I mean, uh, back in Sweden, I, I studied actually at business school, and... Uh, uh, friends of mine at the time actually were living in New York, and I thought, oh, God, I mean, New York is so cool. I want to go to New York. And uh, they were studying at FIT, uh, the Fashion Institute of Technology there. And I thought, well, I can do that. And <laughs> off I went. Uh, so part of my business degree, I did one uh, term at FIT in New York. And when I graduated from business school in Sweden, then I actually went into retail. I worked for NK, which is a department store in Stockholm. And then I worked for Armani for a while in, in Sweden. But then because I had a business degree, obviously I think maybe peer pressure, just I thought maybe I needed to do something that sort of felt more business-like. So I actually went into financial services. I worked for a stockbroker for a while and went into various marketing and communication roles. And actually with that background, and I had finance and fashion, I got a job at American Express here in London, working in the global marketing team, looking after all the big global fashion brands. So I, I was very lucky I got the job, so I looked after Louis Vuitton, Armani, Prada, Gucci, uh, Ralph Lauren, Burberry, and Dunhill, and all these guys. So, I mean, amazing experience to work at the sort of highest level of these brands to do marketing campaigns globally. And uh, spent a couple of years there, also look, working with sort of I mean, big hotels and yeah. airlines, and just got to a stage where I felt, well, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life, being in a big corporate organization? And I thought, no, it wasn't. And this was 2008. It was a financial crisis. 
just was, wasn't a lot of exciting things going on. And I think that's also when you get to a certain stage. I was approaching 40 at that time. Um, and I felt, okay, now is the time to do something on my own. Uh, obviously, I was very passionate about clothes, retail, and also the business side of it. And I thought there was something I could add to the retail market in London. Obviously, they, there's some great, amazing stores with the uh, department stores. You got, I mean, like Harvey Nichols, Selfridges, and Harrods, and uh, Liberties, and then you got Browns and Matches, and then also Savile Row. So I thought, well, what can I add to this? And I thought, maybe just going back to basics a bit more, looking at what uh, used to be around, I mean, small, more intimate uh, menswear shops with a yeah. mix of smart to casual, and you get this a lot in Italy still, and maybe out in the country you get it as well. And I think lots of guys out there, as much as we talk about, it's more accepted these days to love clothes, but there's a lot of guys, they appreciate clothes, but they don't necessarily love the whole experience of going through it. So I wanted to make that as easy and enjoyable as possible. And then, yeah, Trunk was Amazing. launched, and obviously, I mean, Chilton Street was very sort well, of... It's now the street. Yeah, right. it, no one knew about Chilton Street back then. It was very quiet. Half of the shops were empty, obviously, which meant that the rent was very reasonable that I got. And I had actually met Ander Balash, I must admit, at that point, who was obviously uh, the guy that launched the Chilton Firehouse. Uh, but obviously that was, happened four years later, so I just went for it. I mean, uh, opened the doors, and it's been a great experience since. I think... Uh, if you have an idea, you just sort of don't sit around waiting for all the parts to fall into place. At it. some stage, just go for it, and you'll figure out at one point, and people will be there to help you, and don't be afraid to ask for help. I think that's one of my biggest learnings in life, because so many people just want, or they feel that they have to do it themselves, because they're so smart or whatever, but don't do that. Just ask for help. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> and so, Lou and Matt, that's sort of how you guys started it. Guys, the, uh, the rest of you sort of got into menswear. Tell me, you know, Phil, when you started in menswear, I'm imagining that doing private client for menswear when women are spending so much more on fashion was like, why were you doing that? Tell us a little bit about your journey. Um, in, in, in yeah, so, short. you know, very similar. I kind of started straight out of school when I was 16. Um, so I used to, I was at working at um, Reese when I was around 15, used to finish school early and go there and work. Um, and I've always just been sort of really interested in kind of sales at that kind of point. So I was approached to go and work at Matches when I was that kind of young age. And again, that was my first kind of time in a sort of a multi-brand boutique. And then it was also the time where you're 16. That's what, you know, Dolce Gabbana looks like. That's what Gucci looks like. So at that age, when you're kind of put into the deep end, it's like those kind of brands. You do tend to kind of like do all the kind of the hard work and the grafting part of it. And I think that's exactly what... You know, to, to Lou's kind of point as well about what it does take. It does take that kind of bit of grafting and the kind of hard work. And now you're at Farfetch. Farfetch about the IPO this year. I think last valuation was at what? Five billion. Five billion. <laughs> you're heading up global private client for menswear, and, and that's a massive part of the business. Mm. Um, what's it like? Yeah, no, I think like we're really we're we're such a you know constantly evolving kind of company. You know, I think one of the key words we always use at Farfetch is to like obviously remain agile, um, and that's obviously to go around with sort of the fashion business as well. Um, the private client part of it is obviously something that we're really, really passionate about, and it's something that we really are keen to kind of make sure it's a massive part of the business. Um, we've got sort of long-term goals to make it around sort of 40 to 50 percent of the business. So yeah. when you're when you're at that, when where we are just now, we're constantly, constantly expanding um, the private client teams, and this is globally as well. So. We're around sort of 60 to 65 shoppers at the minute. And who's uh, your typical private client? What's their age? How much they spend? Yeah, I think that's the thing about Farfetch. When I'm always asked that question about who the customer is, you actually never actually have a full idea who it is. It's somebody with, that's not a Mr. Porter customer. It's not a Matches customer. It's just completely unique to But Farfetch. what about specifically for what you look after? Exactly the same to that. So it could be people from sort of financial background. It could be sort of art creators. It could be sort of... Um, all, you know, complete various sort of backgrounds. And what do you have to spend to be in the private part <laughs> <private, laughs> category? Um, you have to, yeah, there's a sort of financial kind of target which is up against the kind of client for then. What's and that? I can't tell you that, of course. <laughs> can't let all the secrets away in the one night. No, it's something that it's... 50 it's, grand, 100 grand, 20 grand. No, you're not going to get it out of me. Um, <laughs> have you, this looks like a pre-drink setup when you're 16, yeah. doesn't it? But they, they must have known I'm Scottish, so they got whiskey, <laughs> so it's fine. Um, no, so... 
when we called it private client, essentially what the idea was for it to you know, be private client. So it is a real sort of invitation only kind of service. So that's the way we, we really want to kind of keep it as well. Okay, awesome, love it. So the, Phil, one last question for you on, on this quickly. So I'm in the audience, I'm like, I, wanna, I love these stories, I wanna create a menswear brand. You are like probably one of the best data sources. You've got the world's most wealthy men. What are they looking for? If you were setting up a fashion brand today in menswear, what category, what would be the price point? What, what should we create today that would be your ideal brand to start selling to your group of high net worth individuals? I think it's essentially just what I said, it's you know, keep a personality about it. I think the customer does not want to see something they've seen before. They don't want another Dolce Gabbana, they don't want another Rick Owens. They want something that's completely unique. And I think that's one thing that if I could give any advice is to essentially keep to that kind of mindset. Keep creating, keep being different, keep thinking outside the box. Um, and then from there, you'll start to spark the attention because in this room, even there could be the next, you know, Givenchy, the next sort of big demand. And is there a brand right now, Phil, like a, a small independent brand that you're like, do you know what, they're, they're the guys doing it right at this very moment. They're who I've got on my radar. Yeah, I mean, there is, there's, you know, there's quite a lot, but you know, what I've loved over the past couple of years is people like Ami. Um, they've done sort of some amazing things and from starting from like a really sort of basic sort of aesthetic but then actually turning it into such a, such a global brand now. I think it's one brand to kind of um, maybe model from. You know, Farfetch, we hold over nearly 6,000 brands, so if you were to ever go on the site, you'd never see the same brand kind of twice. So, I, but I think that's the amazing thing about it. You know, it's coming from like boutiques like sort of Trunk, for example, where the, the buyers and the creators of these boutiques actually go out and identify these kind yeah. of brands and bring them to market, and that's the, the remarkable thing for me. Uh, Phil, I know I was gonna ask you one final question on this two questions ago, go but another one. Which is, you, you mentioned like find something unique, do something that hasn't been seen before. Now, I love Ami, but it's very, so it's a, it's a lot of basics. Yeah. It's sort of, you know, a cashmere jumper, things that aren't particularly wild. Some people in the audience go, you know, that's sort of contradictory. Yeah. What was it about them that made that different? I think, to be honest, they did the basic things right. And I think from that, you know, if you look at the full collection, it's not just, you know, yeah, like you say, the basics. It's, it's, you know, basically to get themselves in the door, they found the right time in the right market to get in it with that type of brand. Um, but again, they do then also down the sort of runway release all these sort of special, interesting pieces, which allows probably the creative director yeah. to actually, you know, tap into that part of his and brand. And I always think their cut is really different to what yeah. you see in the market for a basic item. And, and, and Nick, quickly on to you, a um, little bit about you know your career. Why did you go into menswear? And then I'll jump into some questions as well. Um, yeah, I guess like you're saying, you sort of look you look back on your uh, your life and you sort of see um, signs of why you end up in in the career that you end up in. Um, I don't think when I was when I was a child, I don't think I thought about ending up in menswear to a certain extent. Bizarrely, I wanted to be a city planner when I was a child. Um, city planner. Really not, yeah, really, really glamorous career. City planner. I loved it. Well, I grew, up near Mil I grew up near Milton Keynes, and I think that really uh, influenced me. Do, do you if know anyone's what? been to Milton Keynes. I went to school there. It's a great place. But I don't tell people. Oh, it's a great place. <laughs> Everyone should go and visit Milton Keynes, the only city in the UK on a grid system. Very yeah. exciting. Anyway. It's about um, as interesting. <laughs> I'm gonna stop. Yeah, so carry on. So Milton Keynes, fashion so, influence. So Milton Keynes. So yeah. So not a huge amount of fashion influence there. Um, I also the thing is that I I grew up um, in Bedford, um, which is nearish Milton Keynes, but sort of far enough outside of London not to be hugely accessible for London, um, even though it was kind of on my radar. Um, and it was a very you know when I was growing up and I guess it, approaching my teenage years in the very late 90s and early 2000s. Um, you know, it's very hard to access um, style and fashion. Especially uh, in the centre MK. Well, I mean, more exciting than Bedford High Street, <laughs> which, I mean, the most exciting it got was, I think, uh, there was a, a River Island and a JD Sports, and that was really it for menswear. Um, both of which I used a lot as a child. <laughs> really great. Um, but anyway, but also, when I was, when I was younger, um, I, was, um, I was quite overweight, and... I, you know, I was, I was at an all-boys school, and I was a gay boy at an all-boys school, the only, like, gay boy that was basically out, uh, that, that wasn't out, sorry, the only gay boy that was around. Um, and I think that I grew up not feeling particularly confident about myself. Um, and clothes were one of those ways that, for better or worse, I tried a lot of different things to make myself feel confident. And I guess that was the first time where I sort of started to see clothes as, as that, but also getting very interested in clothes 
because of that as well. So I started buying like fashion magazines when I could, and they came to like W. H. Smiths in like half a center, and um, and really started reading up on it and getting into it. And I guess that curiosity only got peaked when I, um, you know, when the internet started, we, we started having the sort of hashtag menswear boom in the early 2000s, where I started to like be able to research hashtag brands Hashtag menswear boom? I didn't know this was it. What, what was yeah, this yeah, boom the whole, I missed like, out on? It was the whole like, you know, the start of the street style blogs and Jack and Jill and the Sartorialist and uh, How to Talk to Girls at Parties and all these yeah, American yeah. blogs coming over. Um, and I think that was really when fashion became a very big interest for me. And it was something that I explored more when I went to university. Um, and by the time I sort of finished university, I'd come to the conclusion that, well, this is actually what I want to do with my life. I want to do this for, yeah. for, for, for forever, if I can, and write about this stuff. Awesome. And that's kind of how I ended up getting involved in fashion, I suppose. And you then worked for, I mean, la this week, actually, we announced that Natalie Massonet um, invested and now involved in Appear Here. Uh, and you actually started off at Mr. Porter. Um, yeah, yeah. With with Natalie um, when she was when she was there. Um, actually, I did a, um, a an interview the other day, and somebody asked me um, a question about um, you know uh, things that you've learned during your career, and that tends to be Natalie Massonet is one of the people that I always talk about in that because I found her completely um, inspirational and a wonderful person to work for. Um, and I think that was because um, when I was at Mr. Porter, I was you know. 23 and the first you know they trusted mr porter which hadn't launched at this point to a 23 year old who had basically you know just come out of internships and you know in those you know almost 10 years ago you just didn't have social media trained they were like he's yeah. young just you know he'll, he'll get he'll, it he'll know about it and i was like trying to run a blog and like i had a, a really terrible youtube channel at the time but it was showing that i was interested in 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 you know the, the internet and the social media so um, the guys really uh, took a chance on me, which was a fantastic, fantastic experience. And Natalie um, was so involved um, in that company, right down to people like me, who was the very you know, smallest cog uh, in the machine and completely young. Um, and uh, one of my best memories of being at Mr. Porter was being there on launch night, and we were all there until about 11 in the evening. Um, and every few minutes, Natalie would come over and she'd be like checking on like how things were going on social and stuff. And she, you know, as a 23 year old, like she was this huge, huge deal. And she knew, she knew my name, like she would come over and say hi in the hallways after that and things. Um, she was a thoroughly inspirational. And that's the sort of thing that, that stays with you. Um, and um, yeah, she's always somebody that I've modeled how I sort of deal with people on since then. Yeah, she's lovely. Mm. Well, Nick, I'm going to come back to you because I've got a few questions on that. But before we get there, um, to tell me about your journey. In notes, it said walking runways, <laughs> then like figuring stuff. Tell us about what happened. So basically, I started off in retail. I mean, my first love and passion is shoes. So when I was 16, I ended up in the stock room at Kurt Geiger and Harrods as just a summer job, and kind of kept going back every summer through my kind of tertiary education. Went to art school, thought I was going to be a graphic designer, went to LCP. Huge fail. Finished the first year, was like, what am I doing here? Let's give this place to someone who actually wants to be here. And um, just was still working weekends in Harrods at Kurt Geiger. So just asked my boss at the time, look, can I come work here full time? I did, kind of worked my way through that. Then ended up going over to Camper and opening the first Camper store outside of Spain in Floral Street, right next to Smithy. Still here now. Yeah. Um, then kind of took three years out, went traveling. And whilst I was travelling, ended up, don't know how, on like in like modelling and being in Tokyo, <laughs> <laughs> and walking on a catwalk, weird. Um, but still, in the meantime, travelling and experiencing the world, came back to London, went back into retail and working for Duffer, which has stood me in a very good stead to this very day, and kind of ended up on Savile Row, opening that store, ended up working in the PR office. And then I went and left and went moved to New Zealand, and I took all my years of retail experience and opened a store. You opened so, your own store? Yeah. Amazing. And then I opened another store, and then I left and came back here, and, but whilst I was there, I, I fell into styling, which I realized was my passion. And ever since then, I've just kind of worked at it and worked at it. Ended up contributing to High Stability about four or five years ago. And now, you know, with the help of 
the friends in the company and the belief of my boss. I'm actually at a position where I can work with brands on a level, consult to them, work with great creatives, work with great designers, great people like the people in this room, yourselves probably one day. Um, so yeah, that's my story. Love it. <laughs> now, very quickly, I'm going to go back to you, Nick, and I'm going to start moving on to stores, retail, what's interesting, what we can learn from what's going on in the industry. You just said you're at Mr. Porter, you're there on launch night, you're with everyone that was behind uh, Netta Porter, you're with the, I'm sure the lovely Jeremy Langmead and people like that who's spoken at one of our last underground sessions. What is the difference between the way that women and men shop? Um, well, um, <coughs> I, sp <laughs> I don't know how necessarily qualified I am to talk about this, um, because Mr. Porter and Netta Porter were very, were quite separate companies. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I guess, without wanting to, to speak in, uh, you guess, know, wide, you broad platitudes, because I'm not a woman, obviously, and, um, uh, I shop, I shop for women, but I'm not a woman shopping. Um, I think what the traditional, um, thought about it is, is that, um, men are very, are creatures of habit, and women tend to um, buy more regularly and more fashion, in a f more fashion-focused way, a more trend-focused way, should I say. Um, that's what traditionally um, people, I would think, would say. Um, as I say, I'm not necessarily a, a woman, so I can only really talk about how necessarily. men speak. Not necessarily. Oh, like the, I'm not sure, necessarily. Depends, <laughs> you know. It's not the weekend, yeah. <laughs> Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Phil. You are in Playa Recla, I'm sure no. you're sat there, you've got people next to you selling to women, you're selling to men. What do you think the differences are? Um, I think, well, I used to probably able to say that women got a lot more excited about sort of fashion, but I think the, the real kind of shift has changed over the past couple of years, yeah, where the the men, men are exactly the same these days, uh, but just in different ways and how they actually kind of achieve and how they actually kind of go about it. Um, so yeah, no, I think, I think it's, it's, it's just as equal as it is just now, but the main difference would be men tend to kind of stick to what they want. They want to be quite private about these things. You know, they don't want to kind of go out and buy sort of fashion. Um, men, uh, sort of men also like to, you know, buy into investment kind of pieces. You know, they like to do a little bit of research. They don't just kind of go straight and go on hold for it, you know. Um, so yeah, I'd say the kind of the main difference between the two would be that. It's also interesting that like, even just thinking about the guys in the office and stuff, you'll see everyone wearing a navy jumper, but a guy will be obsessed over <laughs> It's cool, Thanks. it's nice, I like it. It's a good navy jumper, it's a nice one. But you'll see people wearing a navy jumper and they will be talking about how, you know, it's slightly thicker than the other one or the cut's a bit different. Whereas you don't hear that discussion in women's wear happening as much. It seems that guys are obsessed with the detail. Yeah, and I think the main thing is if we, it's probably quite similar, if we find one thing that we like, we'll always buy it in five different colours. So we'll buy it in you know, ex exactly the same size, we'll just keep rebuying it. Yeah. Where I see a lot of things, we do a massive sort of pre-order kind of shop um, ahead, of this, ahead of the start of the season where, you know, clients can pre-order straight from the runway and it's the difference between men and women in that respect where women will pay upfront six months ahead of time for sort of something that's really, really sort of special that means lots of them. Where if you mention that to a man, it's like, it's okay. If I want a jacket, I'll go out and get a jacket. Yeah, you yeah. Know, they won't have that same sort of buzz and excitement. Yeah, I think we're forgetting about the bragging culture in menswear as well. That, you know, when guys go out and buy something and talk to their mates, look what I've got, buddy. Yeah. You know, and then also the drop culture that's now started off in the last two, three years, especially with publications like ours, yeah. kind of fueling that. So I think that's a big swing and shift as well. For sure, I completely agree. And, and Lou, there's all of these guys telling us, telling you the difference between how men and women shop. You're in menswear, you're a woman, you know the difference, what is it? I totally back up what the boys have said actually, because just from, from a consumer's point of view, I mean, I'm probably a quite that, I'm similar to the chap that will buy the same sweater in navy, about 10 of them from John Smedley, because I know they're gonna see me through <coughs> for another 10 years. But um, I think as a woman, you know, yeah, you know, you, you see the catwalk shows coming out, you want it, you will invest in it, and you'll get it straight away. You're less, sorry girls, but you're less loyal, you're less brand loyal as such, and I think men are very much more driven um, towards quality and, and less about 
you know, quality, sorry, quantity. Um, and you're right, I think, that, you know, we are, you know, we see so much product now, we're so more well informed than we've ever been. So I think men are, you know, they're not such, they're not as shrinking violet as, as, yeah. as they used to be. There is, there is, it's a lot more accessible. So I think that's made a whole lot of difference. But equally, the boys in my life, they do tend to be very loyal to what they like and what they know suits them. Equally, yeah. they'll shop around globally because they have the means to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and just on that, you touched upon Men's Fashion Week and, and well, Fashion Weeks with women. I guess Men's Fashion Week, on the other hand, um, you know, we're talking about how the future of menswear looks really promising, but the future of Men's Fashion Week at the moment is really in question. We're seeing big brands like Burberry, JW Anderson, all of these guys that are now sort of doing consolidating their collections into one and going around fashion week. I guess first question is, is that a problem or would it be better just to have one fashion week? And the second one is how important is men's fashion week to you? When I first started, we were tagged on to, menswear was tagged on to women's wear. We were like, I think it was the afternoon of a Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday. That was my first ever fashion yeah. week, the last Wednesday, um, Wednesday. And, you know, it was good fun, you know. I mean, we're talk it's been great to have been part of that journey and to see how London Fashion Week men's has taken off to the level it has. Um, I think, you know, we're in, we're in tricky times, you know. There's a lot of uncertainty going on. Brexit's just round the corner. You know, budgets have been cut from advertising, from, you know, buyer tri buyer's trips, you know. Manufacturing costs have, in have, have increased. Yeah. But, you know, people are still wanting to pay the same price as they always have done for products. So it's really tricky. So folk are, are reining in their necks. And I think, yeah. you know, when advertising is being cut, you know, and you have, you know, editors of magazines saying, God, I'm having to go out and travel this season to try and get somebody to put a, an yeah. ad in our magazine because, you know, certain brands are not, who you, you think are doing very, very well, are just not parting with the cash. And but just... It, my, my, my take on it is, yeah, we're, it's going to be a tough time, but you just buckle down and get on with it. You know, London is built on creativity, embraces creativity. You just, if you want it, you work hard and you get it. And that's, you can't just fall at the first hurdle. And, you know, I mean, it is it is tough, but you just crack on. And acting on that, because you're, I guess, with High Society, you're going to these different, um, uh, sorry, going to these different um, fashion weeks. London seems also a little bit more closed off, a lot about the big brands. They're now saying, actually, we're going to consolidate. But we had a team this year, and I went to Paris Fashion Week. It was amazing. It was busier than I'd ever seen it. The brands were, it was, seemed so much more accessible. It was on the streets of the Marais. All the streetwear brands were there. Is it that maybe Fashion Week in other cities for men is declining, but it's becoming more about somewhere like Paris? Paris has got the mantle at the moment. Because usually seven year cycles with most things in life, and I think right now, with the way the industry's going, it's gone back to Paris. Mm. All the buyers are going there. All the kind of the energy right now in fashion is there. Yeah. Um, all the big players are there, and even now some of the new gen from London, which is what we are known for, and which is the kind of the kind of the foundation of our whole fashion week, yeah. as it were, mm. they're moving over there. Well, they were. Yeah, I was going to say I saw them in Paris. Yeah. Whereas I mean, I'd, I'd hate to see London completely kind of dwindle, mm. but this, our, this city of ours is, is, as I said, built on the next generation of designers mm. and creatives who are probably in this room right now. So please don't give up. Yeah. And then we, just, you just would, we need you guys to keep us going. Yeah. But as I said, the energy has shifted over to Paris. The buyers are all going there. The houses have got, who have got the money are plowing it in over there. The showrooms are there. People are actually doing business there. I, I yeah. think as well, just touching on that, I think it's got to a stage here that because the times have changed so much, you can step away from it a little bit. And if, you know, whereas you can invest your money in doing a great showroom in Paris, because as you say, that's where all the Japanese buyers are going. You know, everyone's traveling to Paris, so it's a given sometimes uh, and currently they're bypassing London to either go straight to Milan or straight to Paris so and on to New York as well and, and on to New York schedule for buyers it's, it's yeah. a very tough I mean busy time yeah. of the year so. so we've spoken about where your guys journeys in menswear have come from we've spoken about menswear and the growth of the industry we've spoken about um, the difference between men's and women's fashion 
We're gonna open it up to questions very shortly, but what I wanna hear about is who right now in menswear is absolutely killing it? But before we get onto that, I wanna know who is doing terribly. <coughs> like right now, department stores are declining, menswear, you know, in most department stores is pretty shit. Um, you know, mats, you, it's crazy that the department stores are declining when it should all be about selection and editorial. You've nailed that selection and editorial. Who would you wish was more like you guys? Who is just not doing very good at the moment? Well, I mean, when it comes to maybe the brands we are working with are not the ones that are killing it. So maybe you need to ask uh, someone like uh, my friend next to me here. Obviously, we are sort of in more sort of quiet, uh, less sort of noisy space of the menswear. I mean, so, but obviously I think it's amazing sort of with the energy, I mean, you see with uh, at Balenciaga and, and Gucci and these guys, but obviously that's not sort of the territory that that's I'm in, but I think of course it's, it's amazing and it's sort of, uh, I can see the energy and the creativity. So of course it's inspiring to see amazing, that, but obviously yeah. I'm a very different part of sort of the fashion but world. Matt, what I think is interesting with you is you're a great editor, you've got a great eye yeah. in a way. Like you walk into your store and you're like, wow, this is amazing, I'm discovering stuff. Yeah. What department store do you wish you could take over? It's a beautiful building. I mean, I think it sort of uh, gets a lot of things right. But I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, if I had that option, uh, yeah. And what would, would be a great one. if you had a space that big, you had a department store, talk to us. How would it look? How would it feel? <laughs> what would the future be? No, I mean, it would be a great mix, obviously, of brands. I mean, a, a mix of so the, the big brands and also some of the younger brands that you haven't heard of. I think I love, uh, in terms of retail experience, to create a nice sense of discovery, uh, that you're in a space where you get welcomed, you meet people that are actually, pa actually passionate about what they do, uh, they're more interested about you and what you want than, sort of, uh, than their own phone, for instance. And uh, just that creates a nice and welcoming space. There's quite a lot of big brands out there. I mean, they actually do a beautiful job, but it can be quite intimidating for lots of people. And I think for me, it's so important how you make people feel. And I want people to feel good about themselves. And of course, look good, but the feeling inside is very important as 100%. well. And it's also something I think we massively overlook because when you talk about women's wear and men's wear, as you said, Bill, it's massively, once a man is connected to your brand, they're gonna repeat, they're gonna come back again and again and again. But actually, that's a very different user experience. And if that was a technology company, the way that they'd be thinking about sort of the repeat rates and keeping that person engaged, it's quite interesting that you don't see more of a difference between the experience of a menswear and a womenswear store. Yeah. But quickly on, on to your tip, you know, what brand do you look at at the moment and you go, Okay, if I could go in there, this is what I'd do. Brand or store? Oh. You go for both. Yeah, let's uh, hit both. You really put me on this one, aren't you? Um, Who would, you, if you got an email that said, I need you to write about these guys, would you go, no? <laughs> Funnily enough, one of our editors actually did a piece on this brand about two weeks ago, which pretty much went into meltdown on our side. And that was okay. Um, um, what do I say? Um, I couldn't really get my head around the brand when it was in its ascension, and I don't know what's happening to it right now. I think maybe his energies are more focused with Balenciaga, but you know, let's see. And on a more positive note, who do you look at and go, oh, they are killing it? I honestly couldn't tell you. Really? I honestly couldn't tell you. I see so much come across my desk and through the site every day. It would mean a lot of really like diving deeper into... Okay, but that's, that, that's really interesting. So if I'm sat in this audience right now, I want to launch a menswear store. Yeah. I'm thinking about how I'm going to do it, how I'm going to make you interested. Yeah. Talk to me about if you were setting up a brand today, what you'd be doing, how it'd be looking, what would be different about it that would make you go, okay, actually, this is like one we need to read, write about and two I know my readers are going to get obsessed with. Um, it's, it's about doing the basics right. So start off, great product. Great product. 
Attention to detail. Attention to detail. Um, create that USP that it's very hard out there to find what it is because there's nothing original anymore. The USP, like without us sounding like yeah. a James unique, Khan unique or Donald point. Trump book. Like, what do we mean by that? Like, what is it? What's a unique selling what point? What is the unique selling point that we what want is, to what is the on? What is the story of your brand? Yeah. Is it the technicality of it? Is it the, is it the tailoring of it? Is it the functionality of it? It needs a story. It needs a story. Um, but then sometimes you just come across great product that just goes, blows you away. And who is it right? Is, and there's no one right now that you can pick out that you say blows you away. Really quick on the spot. I'll let you think about it. Yeah, I'll think about okay. it. Okay. Um, Lou, store experience. Who do you, you know, you've got your own brand. What store experience do you look at and go, oh, they inspire me? And which one do you go, I'm, I love this brand, but I'm just disappointed in what they're doing right now? I'm not going to talk. I won't say brand, but we touched one of the first stores I when I first came to London on a field trip with university thinking, ooh, what I was so overwhelmed. It was such a beautiful building. It's and amazing. as you say, you know, I, I tend to go to the homeware department and, the, you know, it's to look at the china and so forth because I'm not inspired by the rest of it. So actually that's one store that I do feel like needs a kick up the butt. But, um, I mean, we touched on Supreme earlier. I still think that, that they're, they're driving it. You know, when you go into DSM, Dover Street Market, and you go down to the basement and you see these young kids, they're not interested in... Com. They're not interested in Vermont. They're interested in just going in there, getting that trainer and walking back out. Yeah. And, you know, I agree with what we talked about Virgil before. But, you know, Kim Jones set up such an amazing collaboration when Vermont was going yeah, at it amazing. full tilt. Doing that Supreme LV was just phenomenal. Yeah. And because those kids that were, like you say, you know, unaware of that kind of... Um, sort of heritage brand are being inspired to go in there and buy it and to me that I think that's fantastic and that guy I think yeah it's quite special it's the next generation which is what we talked about yeah. they're the kids that are going to drive it I do wish they'd taken forward. it further I think they did like their store in the middle of Soho I think if they'd have taken it to like I would have loved to have seen that like Supreme Vuitton shop pop up in like Dalston or somewhere else but anyway yeah. um, you Nick. can't get it down Dalston <laughs> if you really try. I don't know <laughs> Nick um, what about you? You're a writer, this is what you do day in, day out. Who is killing it? Who is killing it in the right way and who's killing it in a bad way? Um, I suppose going back to what, um, uh, what um, Etit was just talking about, um, I think that the, bring this back sort of from designer and talking about the high street, I think what's tricky about the British high street at the moment, when I look at it now from when I was younger, um, is that a lot of high street um, brands, certainly British high street brands, I feel have lost their way. And in the age of the internet... Who's lost it more than anyone else? Well, I mean, the, 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 big, the big case study for that would be... Some, this is not, this is not no, talking just, about cool brands. Know, we're friends, just but tell us. This is, would be... No. <laughs> Would be would be BHS. BHS was a brand. They've that disappeared. They've gone. Exactly. Well, they just they in the internet age, BHS kind of lost its way because all of a sudden it wasn't. It was taken over by by places like Primark that did fast fashion kind of better, and then it was taken over by ASOS who did cool clothes that aren't expensive better. And so, and I think you're seeing that in a lot of brands at the moment. And especially, I think we are very spoiled in London with uh, the high street. But I think when you look at high streets outside of the UK, when you get the sort of regional versions of brands that are already, you know, shops are already struggling in London, yeah. they're an even kind of less of a reason to go in them because they've lost what the story behind them is. Yeah. And I think that in the internet age, these stores really have to think about that. Um, one of the ones that kind of breaks my heart, and I don't understand why it isn't kind of doing better considering the fashion climate at the moment, is I think Gap, now is the time for a Gap revival. Like, when I, when in the 90s, like, Gap was the brand. It was like that and United Colors of Benetton. Those were the two big high yeah. street brands. And you've seen places like, you know, Tommy Hilfiger... Um, completely changed their aesthetic Reinvent. over the past few years yeah. by basically going, and even Ralph Lauren to a certain extent with its reissue of its its polo line from the 90s. You know, these brands have Gap gone like, the 90s are a big it. thing, yeah. we're going to reissue all the 90s stuff. And there are lots of brands, there are a few brands that still exist from the 90s that haven't done that yet, and I don't quite understand 
why they haven't done it. And it, and it kind of breaks my heart they haven't because it would be a really, maybe a quick fix for the company, yeah. but a quick fix that I think would relate it to a younger audience again that are in. It's also funny when you look at businesses like Everlane. I took my mum to one of the Everlane shops and I was like, look how cool these guys are, look what they're doing. Da -da -da -da. And she was like, well, yeah, but it's Gap. I was like, no, 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 but like, look at this, and they've got the jeans, and the white t and she was like, yeah, but it's Gap. And then I was like, but look at the store design. Yeah. And she was like, it feels like a Gap. And I yeah. suddenly was like, yeah, you're, you're probably right. And it's yeah. interesting that we're all getting obsessed with a lot of these new direct-to-consumer brands, but actually, those guys probably still have a place, and it's how do they become, yeah, as you said, yeah. more relevant. Um, go on, were you gonna say something else? No, that was basically that. <laughs> so, so I was going to say, I'm very, I'm very excited to see what um, Hyder Ackerman's up to now he's left Baluti. That was going to be my yeah. person that's killing it, because yes. I loved no, his three one. seasons at Baluti were one of my favorite things of my time in menswear. Um, and I'm really sad that he's left after three seasons, um, at, but I just can't wait to see what he does next, because I think, okay. you know, it's, it's just brilliant what he does. Now, Nick, I'm going to quickly tip one to make a quick point, then I'm going to ask Phil that last question. Who in the audience has questions? Put your hands up. Okay, there's two. Now put them back down. We're going to go back round. They're going to answer. He's going to answer. And then there's going to be more hands. So, Atir, what was the point you were going to make? That, that brand you asked me that was killing it. Yeah. It's oh. Martin Rose. Martin Rose. So, also, tell for those in the audience who don't know what that is, tell us. So, she is a very old menswear designer, Martin. Probably your. Yeah, yeah, she is. One of your peer yeah. group, to be honest. And she. I think it's because you said she's a very old designer, like your peer, and then we sort of said you didn't mean it in that way, no, naturally. Um, but we're going to carry on. I'm very old too, so <laughs> don't worry. Um, but she's she's actually killing it right now in terms of what she's doing coming back, and also designing the menswear at Balenciaga. And yeah, and I think it would be yeah. for yeah. sure. And finally, um, Phil, menswear brand doing well, and we're going to go to the audience. Yeah, I mean, I'm not bottling this question in any way, shape, or form, but what I generally think is that it depends what brand you're talking about is looking at what type of customer. I think you can either look at like a global customer, you look at like a local customer, yeah. so like a local boutique, like like a trunk, you know, they're, shop, they're buying for what, what they like within the local kind of area. So I can't actually put my finger on a brand that could be, you know, not doing as well as they should be, because from, from my point of view, from my, from my brand, it's, it's, it, you know, it's going across the full scale. You can't actually pinpoint something that's, that's doing really bad because what might not work in London would work incredible in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And because we're looking at our global customer, I think it's very, it's very difficult to make that call. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you one question, which is just right now, you, you know, Farfetch has the world's best boutiques all in mm -hmm. one platform for yeah. around the globe. Who right now, if we were all, you know, everyone in this room, I'm sure travels, they go to different cities, what is the one boutique that you think, if we were anywhere in the world, people in this room should go check out? Difficult question. Um, easy for you. Um, <laughs> no, there's um, there's a boutique in Paris called Le Carre in the Marais, uh, which is an incredible kind of boutique. And they actually, the thing is, which I loved about boutiques, and like I said earlier on, I started at Matches, so yep. boutiques in my kind of DNA. I love the multi-brands, the individuality, the own personality. So. I love that boutique for me as the one that kind of pushes the limits and can actually cater to a global customer because somebody that can buy something there can also buy it in Shanghai, that could also buy it in Riyadh, could buy it in Moscow. It's, yep. it's that type of boutique. Uh, and you just sort of said there were no brands you didn't think were doing well um, or you could pinpoint, but you, know, you said your obsessions with the multi-brand and yeah. that editorial and, and the way that the selection is. All the department stores right now are completely declining. Um, do you have any your final thoughts on that? Um, no, I think that for me, I'll, I'll always sort of back anything that's, that's got that, that sort of core from what they've always kind of done. I think it's also about kind of reinventing yourself and kind of moving with the time. So if there is any sort of multi-brand sort of department store like that, I think it's a case of not try to try too hard about it, but stay true to what you actually knew and what you were kind of good at um, and to kind of crack on from there. Yeah, and it, it's interesting. I think that department stores were back in the day a lot about show business. And I read something recently and saw that Bloomingdale's in New York once shut down and had like all the Japanese brands and food and everything take over. And then somewhere along the line, I guess it got run by accountants. Um, okay, opening up to the audience, we've got a couple of questions. Who's got their hand? Then we, we sort of, I'm getting time told that we're over, but no one's left the room, so I'm going to keep. Okay, great. 
um, with the very chic scarf around your neck. Very, very big question. So customer journey, and I guess a really interesting question because menswear we've said are, are repeating. Um, because of that little giggle tip, I'm gonna put it first to you. <laughs> Any thoughts? Journey, I mean, are we talking on a retail level or on a physical brick and mortar when people are store now? <laughs> As you want. Um, Fudge, you've really done me that one. Um, and Matt, so I'm going to come to you on this Matt, as well. I think I'll hand it to Matt. Matt, you okay. go. No, I mean, I think there's so many touch points. I think it's sort of something, an ongoing process that is always happening because it's through Instagram, it's through your website, it's all sort of touch points that sort of uh, where you are touching uh, the customers in the sort of physical and digital space. So obviously when it comes to the store environment, it's from that second even before, I mean, if you're in a store or a department store, it's like before the customer or potential customer even reaches you, you need to be really on seat as you're on stage where in the shop, you're being looked at and whatever you do can be interpreted in one way or the other. So it's about just being very welcoming and sort of seeing the customers and uh, meeting sort of their needs. And also, I mean, lots of customers that come into the stores now, they have an idea of what they want, right? They've been on your website or they've been on Instagram and they've seen something. So generally they come to you because they've seen something that m created an interest. And uh, it's obviously then throughout, that, I mean, that's sort of where it starts. And then it's just looking after the customer, really being uh, receptive uh, to what their needs are and, and trying to sort of uh, get to know them to be able to deliver the service that they want. And then obviously, hopefully they find something that they like and uh, you sort of serve them and you give it to them and then it's also, then it continues, it doesn't stop that. So it's, a, it's like a full circle because then it's about sort of after sales, making sure that they're happy with it and following up and hopefully then getting them to become loyal and to come back for more. So it's, it, it never stops. It's just sort of a, it's a hopefully a positive circle. It's an ongoing journey. Thank you, Matt. Um, we've got a question on here for Phil. So it says, with so much competition, how do you ensure that private clients keep coming back to you and don't go elsewhere? Um, basic answer that we can. Um, there's, there's the in the personal shopping sort of um, game. There's, there's very sort of little each sort of competitor can kind of offer. Um, that's going to be sort of different and completely revolutionary from what the other competitors do. Um, for me, it's, it's even to the point that was just kind of mentioned. It's about that kind of experience. You know, it's like how your package is going to kind of arrive. You know, are you going to get it the next day? Or are you going to get it in two to four days? Are you going to get it in a week? Um, I think that, that comes down to it. And then what, what I always say about, especially with private client, is, is looking at outside of just a service and a benefit. Because we can all sign up to anything tomorrow and get all these kind of benefits, free shipping, blah, blah, blah. But it's the, it's the experience element that we do bring into it in sort of private client, yeah. which will, again, something that's, that a lot of watch brands do us as well. They'll, they'll create these experiences and various members of the press will be quite lucky to go in these incredible experiences yep. that's like one of a kind. Um, so for me, that's what's something that we'll never be able to get the customer loyal. Um, we've got to be kind of honest with ourselves with that part. But what we can do is open up to these experiences that will actually then make sure that the person that's ever think of fa fashion or luxury fashion will always come back to the, their personal shopper. Yeah, and I guess experience is a lot about how does it make you feel, right? And what's interesting there with the journey piece and what you just said is, you know, even a business like Mr. Porter, where you were at the beginning, that moment of getting the package and it arriving the next day and it having your name on it saying Mr. and you're set, all of those little touches, it, it gives you a feeling more than just, you know, something that you're transacting with. Um, any more questions in the audience? I've got another one online. Um, in the red hat first. Yeah. How 
Okay, so we, we, we did touch on this before and we mentioned that Paris is now sort of the focus, but Phil, I don't think you had a point there when we mentioned it earlier, um, so maybe you'd like to add an additional comment. Um, no, I think that, that for, for me, it's that creativity which is kind of taking taking a hit to that. So it's you know it's the it's the when everything is getting smaller and smaller, and it can be condensed into like a day. To me, it kind of lacks that whole reason why we all got into this in the first place. You know, it's what that element that we kind of saw, which actually made us wake up and kind of go, yes, I want to get into this. So yeah, that that to me would be is the um, is a point which I'd like to kind of make that it's yeah. it, the slowing down of it is actually slowly killing that creativity and stopping the next generation kind of coming through. To 100%. Kind of and I, I do think the point I touched on earlier about the accessibility, what was interesting is I was walking down the Marais in Paris and there was a couple of streetwear brands that were doing press days and, and people were walking off the street and they were like, oh, just come in, have a beer, have a look. And that feeling of it not being behind closed door, I think only encourages that creativity, it inspires people and also builds, um, you know, as you said, the whole thing that you get into it in the first point. Um, uh, any other questions? There's one here. Yeah. Hi. Hello. So that happened in the past year because we had the Marais International Day in Paris. And I was just wondering, A, whether you think that that was a success or a failure? And also, what are your thoughts on using the right time to do things like that? Who, who, who in particular is your question for? Anyone. Um, who would like to answer it? Um, I, I would like to say that um, I was I was very excited when Isabel Morant um, said she was launching menswear, and I really do love her first collection. Um, I have always thought that, in a way, um, her brand is something that didn't really exist aesthetically for men um, beforehand. I mean, I bought so much of the H&M collaboration when she did that, um, when that was the only menswear that she offered, um, which was incredible. Um, I don't think there's really um, a huge amount you can say before you've seen what they're going to do, those designers. I think Jacquemus launching menswear is very exciting, um, although the only bit that we've seen about it so far is his jumper that he wore on the with catwalk, which was lovely, so that bodes well. Um, <laughs> But you know, it's, I suppose it's a bit of a circular question in the end because you don't really know until you see it. But you know, I think we're in this, this interesting time at the moment, to go on a bit of a tangent, um, that I was talking to Lou about earlier, where um, there is this movement in a sort of a PR-y kind of movement towards like, you know, hashtag gender neutral um, clothing, which I think is being embraced by some brands in a great way and some brands in a maybe more mm, cynical way way because it's seen as fashionable. Um, but I think as a whole, the gender neutral vibe, um, lots of designers are still figuring out what that means. Um, yeah. Does that mean having an offering for both men and women? Does that mean having a unisex offering? Does that mean yeah. having menswear that is yeah. more feminine or women's wear that is more masculine? Um, and I think that actually feeds into the, the mixture of shows in Fashion Week as well. Um, all in all, I think it's ended quite an interesting time for fashion at the moment. It's in flux um, yeah. between the sexes. And we'll see how that plays out because no one can really tell at the yeah. moment. Well, Browns, but in short, Isabel Morant for men. Yeah. But what's interesting <laughs> there is Browns, the, um, sort of s the, the, the subsidiary of Farfetch, their own boutique, their new East London store, they've mixed up both min menswear and womenswear. So they don't tell you anywhere that they're different and it's just about you know, what you like. And even Gucci right now, the silk shirt, shirts, you've seen girls wearing as much as men. Um, Phil, any, anything to add on to that with the gender neutral point? No, I think it, it, it definitely, it just kind of opens up even more. And it's not a case of, you know, brands capitalizing on you know, getting the most out of that kind of product. I think it's actually giving the nod to kind of both, kind of both sexes that they can actually do it. So I think, you know, for me, it makes complete sense for it to do. It. And okay. I think, you know, the first boutique which I ever saw doing it was like a Dover Street Market where you could go in there, it was like a, it was like a maze. You can never know what bit you're going to trip over. And that, but again, it adds to that kind of excitement part of it and that yeah. experience part, so. Awesome. Final question from the audience. Final question of the night. Uh, yep, you, Mr. Gentleman, with the, with the, with the suit on.
Thank you so much for your question. Tip, you were, you've, your background's included Savile Row and then working at High Stability. I think there's no better person to answer that question. Um, bespoke is quite a niche area that we get into. And I think the price point is the biggest kind of thing that we look at there. Because once you get something custom tailored, fitted, made for you, fabricated, you start to get into all those details, you know, it's just, it just gets a bit difficult to be accessible to everyone. And they have to really want to get something made especially for you. But, but the caveat to that is didn't, you know, you guys just said that Supreme and things like that, the whole reason why it's thriving is that it's so unaccessible in many ways and so scarce. Is it though? Well, well in, ter I, I, in, ter in terms of the production level, outside. in terms of the production level, but what the marketers have done and what James Shebier and the guys behind it have done really well is, is the way they've created the drop date culture, the way they've made this thing, you can only get it now, and then it's gone. But it's not gone, it gets resold. Yeah. Yeah. So with Which Bespoke, it's completely different. It's, 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 yours. For one it's yours for life, and you get it altered, and it, gets, it stays with you for life. So it's, 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 there's a whole different thought process going in, into that one, I think. 100% good answer. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question, I think, that you've asked. And it would, you know, it depends. It's, it's a specific type of consumer, a specific type of person that would be able to afford it, but also the thought process for them to go through it and do it. And Lou, do you have anything to add to that one? I, I totally agree, but I, I think, you know, obviously as Nick has touched on, we've all touched on tonight, you know, Sportswear Lux is kind of leading the market at the moment, but I do think there's that consumer out there that has that backlash to that, that will always, you know, that's what makes fashion so exciting, you know, you only have to walk down this street, you know, all the blokes, all the girls, they all dress so very differently, yeah, there are those, there are the packs and there are the tribes of, you know, who are being led and being influenced, but what makes London so, I don't know, so special and is the fact that it's the diversity and the fact that you can come as you are and do what you want. And I think it, to hold on to that is incredibly important in times like this. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. And we have, you know, this month we've got underground sessions much like this happening <coughs> in Paris, New York and here. And I think what you just said about London is something which I think is so true and why I absolutely love this city. And, you know, I think from the conversations we've had today about menswear, how this is growing, how it's changing, how it's such an exciting industry to be part of within fashion, but also what's going on with gender neutrality. And I oh forgot that was a big word for after a whiskey. Um, but, but how this is all changing, I think, just shows us that there was something about menswear. We're obsessed with quality, obsessed with detail, obsessed with maybe not having as much, but having the right things and then going back, feeling that we're part of something. And we touched upon the beginning whether actually some things that women were buying was falling under the umbrella of menswear. And, and maybe that's the point that this is all now, the lines are blurring, and the future is that everyone's becoming more obsessed with where their item comes from, the quality of it, and the experience and how it makes them feel. Um, so I'm incredibly proud to have such an amazing lineup of speakers, it's incredible to see a room so full of people and such amazing questions. Thank you for being part of our community at Peer Here, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. And if you could put your hands together, first of all, for this amazing space, um, which was given to us by, I have to do the serious bit now, Campfire Spaces that will be launching an amazing collaborative workspace here. Also to our sponsors, to the charity, which is Mind, that helps um, men and women with mental health problems. And... Finally, to our incredible lineup. Thank you very much.